Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, very excited to um, sit here and learn with everybody today. I will be moderating this session, so please feel free to use the chat and the Q&A um, throughout the session, and um, we'll try to answer your questions as best we can. I and mean, we'll also have a portion for Q&A at the end. So um, yes, thank you for joining us. Um, I am going to pass it over to our wonderful presenters today, and thank you for joining us. I have draw. I am dropping the link for the eval in the chat. So just as a reminder, when you have a moment, please fill out the eval. And we're also going to have a couple polls at the beginning of this event. So mm -hmm. feel free to participate so we can get to know you a little bit better. Okay, thank you. Should we maybe introduce ourselves in the order of our presentation? Oh, sure. <laughs> so on the slides, well, anyway, I'll just start. I'm, I'm Naomi Shapiro. I'm a professor emerita at U University of California, San Francisco. Um, I have been a pediatric nurse practitioner at La Clinica de la Raza School-Based Health Centers on and off for about 15 years. Um, I'm very excited to participate today. I'm Lisa Mahali. I'm currently um, a professor at UCSF in family healthcare nursing, and my clinical practice is in the is with adolescents and young adults. And I've done a lot of work in my career in reproductive health, so I'm also very excited to be here. Hello, thank you for coming to our workshop today. My name is Erin Kramer. I'm a family nurse practitioner working in um, reproductive and adolescent health for about 14 years. Um, most of that time I've been spent in school-based health centers in Oakland, California, La Clinica de la Raza, and in New York City. Um, right now I'm overseeing the, uh, the LARC provider training at La Clinica and, and have developed for the last few years a LARC doula training program for our support staff, our medical assistants, and health educators. Hi everyone, my name is Emma Brenner Bryant. I'm the health education supervisor at um, school-based health centers at La Clinica de la Raza. Um, and uh, before that, I was working in Boston at a school-based health center doing sexual and reproductive health care. Um, and I've been supporting Erin um, to develop training for our AmeriCorps health educators around the LARC doula program. So we, um, in terms of disclosures, Emma and I have no disclosures. Erin uh, has been funded by the Joseph and Zero Long Foundation to expand doula training at La Clinica de la Raza in Oakland, California. And Lisa is a certified Merck Nexplanon trainer. Next slide. So are the polls, We so y'all probably know this, we can't see the polls when they're happening. So the polls are live, I believe. Um, so we're just waiting for you to fill the polls and for us to get the results. And also, while you're doing that, if you want to just say hi in the chat and tell us um, if there's anything in particular you wanted to walk away from this workshop uh, knowing or discussing, we'd love to hear from you. Let's see the polls at the right. Dr. Shapiro, would you like me to read out the poll results? Or are you able to see them? Uh, no, why don't you read them? That would be great. So, <clears throat> so we've got um, 10 votes for where in California are you located. 20% uh, are in Northern California, 50% in the Bay Area, 10% in the Central San Joaquin Valley, and 20% in Southern California. Well, welcome, everybody. And for a role in school-based health center, we have six votes. 16.7% uh, are administration or site supervisor. 16.7% are front desk. 50% are health educator. And 16.7% are provider. 
And Great. we have seven votes for in my school based health center. 14.3% uh, we do not provide confidential services and 85.7% we insert both implants and IUDs. Wow, great. And the final great. question, we have seven votes. Teens identify which of the following is their primary deterrent to choosing a LARC. 87.5% fear of a painful procedure and 12.5% concerns about changes in their menstrual cycle. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, we will we will discuss that last question when we when we get to the more specifics about about LARC insertions. Um, so, uh, Sarah, could we go to actually slide number eight? The LARC recommended this first line. Thank you. So, um, as many of you know, since a lot of you are inserting LARCs, um, they have a higher efficacy and higher continuation rates and higher satisfaction rates compared with short-acting contraceptives among um, adolescents who use them. Next slide. And um, IUDs have been available for quite a long time, um, and implants have also been on the market for a while. Um, and recommendations have changed about teenagers, but uh, is, Definitely in the last five or six years, uh, policy statements have come out from both the American Academy of Pediatrics and the um, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists uh, to recommend uh, long-acting reversible contraception as the first-line contraception for adolescents. Next slide, please. Um, this is a really interesting survey, I think, um, and it's from the Contraceptive Choice Project. This was a, you know, it's been a while ago, but this. Uh, as part of a Missouri project and study, they offered all adolescents free birth control for a year, and they did some kind of, uh, you know, follow-up at, at one year. And you can see that the, the progesterone IUD had the highest continuation rate, 80%. Um, the ring, the contraceptive ring, had the lowest continuation rate. But um, beyond continuation rates, the highest satisfaction rates were also for the IUDs and the implants, and much higher than the Depo-Provera shot, the oral contraceptives, the patch, or the ring. Um, I would like to point out that none of the satisfaction rates were higher than 65%, so we have a long way to go uh, in providing really effective and really, uh, you know, minimal side effect contraception. But those are, you know, th those are the satisfaction rates. So teens are saying not only are they in, they're keeping in, the LARCs, but they really prefer them to other methods. Next slide. So we wanted to talk about from the teens' point of view, from our experience in, in counseling teens, uh, about the contraceptive and non-contraceptive benefits of LARC. So from the teen point of view, uh, they're not dependent on the willingness of the partner or the need for use at the time of sexual activity. They don't have to think about it or hide it from, say, parents uh, or maybe a partner who doesn't want them to be on birth control. There's, uh, for the implant and the IUD generally, uh, there's less weight gain compared to the injection, for example. And then this is a long-term plan for teens who are, who really desire postponing pregnancy until their mid-20s. And I have to say, in my years of counseling teens, when we ask teens, I try not to assume that they're going to want to have a child, but when I ask teens with a uterus, if they're thinking about having children, when they would have a child, pretty much typically mid-20s is the, the earliest that most teens say they want to have a kid. Um, and so uh, non-contraceptive benefits are light to no periods. And these are really advantages to teens uh, who may not necessarily be seeking contraception, but have uh, some really, really heavy periods or maybe have a bleeding disorder. Um, these are being recommended now for teens with bleeding disorders, uh, teens with disabilities who have a lot of difficulties with menstrual hygiene, and then trans and non-binary youth with a uterus who prefer not to menstruate. Um, and the fact that the uh, implant and the uh, progesterone IUD and even the, the copper IUD have no estrogen is also a benefit to those genes. Uh, next slide. Um, so distrust from disadvantages of LARC from a teen point of view are distrust of the method. There are a lot of myths out there that if you're on a long-term effective birth control method in which you don't menstruate, um, that you're gonna have fertility problems afterwards. Um, there's distrust of the medical system, which is often warranted. Uh, some teens just say, I don't want a method, I can't stop on my own. 
Um, they dislike the need for an insertion procedure. Um, we'll talk about quite a bit more about that later. Um, they may prefer actually a regular menstrual cycle, either for their just their own, they just want to have a regular period, or they feel many teens say that they have family members who are tracking their periods and they need to have a regular period. Um, and then there are some non-contraceptive benefits of combined hormonal contraception, so estrogen, progesterone, um, in, in giving a regular cycle. And also um, the effect of LARCs might be neutral on acne, but it's never beneficial. Um, so um, uh, yeah, so um, uh, so um, if for teens who really want improvement in their acne, they may need to go back to or choose a method of estrogen. Next slide. Um, and just a little bit more, I don't know if there's any questions or comments coming up, but feel free to put comments along the way. We're watching the chat. Um, so uh, in the United States, uh, it's important to think about contraceptive access, uh, knowing that uh, in terms of the legal system in the United States, minors have no legal rights of their own. The United States is the only country that hasn't ratified the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. And, so, and this affirmatively gives children some rights and several of those pr provisions imply confidentiality rights around their health care. Um, so there are limited privacy exceptions um, that do allow teens to consent to STD treatment and birth control, and these vary from state to state. There are a lot of structural inequities that prevent access to, to contraception uh, and reproductive health care in general. So they can be geographic, transportation, um, even just, you know, a clinic could be a few miles away, but inaccessible by public transit, uh, economic access, and then provider bias, um, age-related bias, bias against racial and ethnic groups, gender bias, and perceived socioeconomic status bias um, that really prevent their access. Next slide. So um, in the United States, adolescents have rights to confidential access to contraception by state law in 27 states and the District of Columbia with no restrictions, in 29 states under special circumstances. Um, four states have no regular relevant regulations for or against, um, but uh, provider may actually inform parents of confidential care in eight states and STI treatment in 18 states. Even though all 50 states give teens the right to confidential STI treatment, the provider can still inform the parents that they were treated for an STI in, 15, in 18 of those states. Next slide. In California, uh, adolescents have the right to confidential confidential access to contraception. There's actually no lower age limit in the law. And, uh, and adolescents have the right to confidential access to SDI testing and treatment and other confidential services from age 12 and up. And then when we talk about reproductive rights, reproductive rights are legal access to reproductive and sexual health services, but reproductive justice, and we do come from a reproductive justice framework, is the human right to practice autonomy over one's own reproductive and sexual health. For example, choosing when and if to reproduce um, and to have financial and geographic access to the method of choice. So um, next slide. And these just show you, I'm gonna have to actually look on my own paper slides, um, show you the California um, birth rates. So you can see Birth rates in California overall as a state are lower than the national average. But uh, in the Central Valley area and some of the areas that are dark blue on the California map, the birth rates are actually higher than the national average. And the birth rate also varies um, by, ethnic by ethnicity. So the highest birth rates are on Latinx, among Latinx teens, then um, African, then um, and also American Indian Alaska Native teens, African American teens, and then lower for multiracial teens, white and Asian teens. So there are inequities in access to contraception um, and uh, differences in how teens may, some of some teens who are having babies as adolescents maybe may have decided that that's something they definitely want, but we know that a large percentage of pregnancies um, are actually unplanned in this age group. So I don't know if you have any comments about this uh, change. And just uh, next slide. 
So as adolescent STI rates during the pandemic dropped for a while. Uh, that's people weren't going anywhere, but they're up again. So uh, this is a statistic that comes up pretty easily and is quickly reported. We don't actually have statistics yet on what the pregnancy and birth rates have been among teens during the pandemic and since. But I, I, I don't know if you want to say anecdotally, we're hearing from a lot of people that there are a lot more teen pregnancies than they're used to seeing now that teens are coming back to clinics. So I don't know if people want to say anything in the chat about that, but we welcome, we welcome your chats. Um, and if you are noticing more STI cases, just as the, as the, these are the national rates. Next slide. So we wanted to just talk a little bit about reproductive coercion. Reproductive because, um, just because uh, LARCs are not entirely under the teen's control in terms of insertion or removal. So reproductive co coercion is interfering with an individual's right to make autonomous decisions about their reproductive and sexual health. This is rampant worldwide for poor indigenous and minority populations has been part of national policies to control and increase population, and has included forced sterilization in which the individual is often not informed. Um, and then we have learned actually for some of folks who've been uh, incarcerated uh, at the border and uh, because of their immigration status that this is still continuing today. African-American, Latinx, indigenous and disabled persons have experienced reproductive coercion around both LARC device placement and removal. In 1990s, the court judges offered uh, Norplant, which was a precursor to Nexplanon as an implant in exchange for lighter sentencing or to avoid federal prison terms. And in California, uh, for a while additional public benefits were offered to women on public assistance if they agreed to have the Norplant inserted. So this is not the distant past. This is like very recent past. And some for some it's ongoing. Next, next slide. Um, in the United States, uh, you can't really discuss LARC promotion without acknowledging how these methods may have been used to control fertility of particular communities over the past decades. I find in my own counseling with teens that it's really helpful to talk about this. And often teens, um, especially teens from groups that have experienced reproductive coercion, maybe actually consulting elders in their family you know, on the phone in the clinic when they're thinking about um, thinking about ARCs. Um, and we want to, it's really important also to remove barriers to removal. So current practices often promote same day LARC insertions, but may require multiple visits for LARC removal. So this may increase adolescent mistrust and reluctance to have LARC inserted. So we think it's really important to review and revise these clinic policies if the effect is seen as coercive by teens. And this uh, joint statement of reproductive justice, um, these are guiding principles. This has been um, endorsed by a number of organizations. Remember that the um, patients have the right to choose any method of birth control or to choose not to use birth control for your persuasion. They have the right to promote removal of an, to prompt removal of an IUD or implant for any reason without judgment or resistance from the provider. They should receive medically accurate unbiased and culturally relevant information about and access to the full range of contraceptive methods and contraception as part of a healthy sex life beyond fear of pregnancy, recognizing non-contraceptive reasons that individuals may seek these methods. So I'm gonna um, turn this over to Lisa. Next slide. Um, thanks. Are there... Um... Are there any questions that folks want to ask? There was just one comment about STIs um, in the chat, and I apologize for the background noise. Um, any other questions that people want to throw into the chat at this point? Otherwise, we'll keep going. Okay. Um, so, I'm sorry, Naomi, did you talk about this re reproductive justice slide, or am I starting there? I did talk about it. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, thank you. I, I was confused for a minute. I think, maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, 
All right. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about several different issues, including I want to touch on the issue of what happened to adolescents and young adults during the COVID pandemic. There's a lot that we still don't know, but I think um, given that it seems very likely that over the next few years, unfortunately, we will probably be cycling in and out of more and less COVID related constraints that it's really important to think about the ways in which the pandemic and the lockdowns affected young people and their contraceptive choices. So this slide um, gives you just a little bit of a sense that many, many, many young adults, adolescents and young adults found that their contraceptive and that their reproductive health um, options were impacted by the pandemic. And in fact, that um, that they most that they had in uh, what's the word? what am I trying to say that the impact was particularly strong on those young people who we know have a harder time accessing services anyway. So folks who have been historically marginalized, whether by race or LGBTQ status uh, or poverty were especially impacted, which I don't think surprises anybody. Among other things, a lot of the school based health centers where most of you work and where a lot of young people get their services, a lot of those places were closed during the, the lockdown. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so one of the things that we have all found, all of us, all four of us have worked in settings that provide LARCs, is that it's really, really important that the front desk be very well trained. The folks, some of you are front desk workers, and I think you, I'm sure you can add to what I'm saying that we know that the first point of contact for a young person interested in the contraceptive method is incredibly important. So here, I'm not going to read this whole slide, but I think some of the things that we encourage you to use these talking points and build on them that um, incur talking to young people about how effective the LARC methods are, if in fact avoiding pregnancy is a high priority for them, that their low hormone or no hormone methods is very important to a lot of young people. Safety is, is very important, as is impact on future fertility. And I think um, Naomi referenced this, that a lot of young people do say they want to have a baby sometime in the next five or 10 years. And they wanna, they're they really concerned that whatever we're doing is fully reversible and not going to affect their future fertility. It's, in, I think, often really helpful to remind young people that the LARCs are easy to use. They don't, we, we as providers do the work and there is an insertion procedure that particularly uh, Aaron and Emma are going to talk a little bit more later about ways to make that a more manageable process for young people. But once the method is in place, there's nothing for people to remember to do. And then for folks who want protection for a long time, it, it, in reinforcing that can be helpful. I, I find that often I have to reassure young folks that the LARC method, even though it can be used for four years or seven years or 12 years, that those are maximums and not minimums. I have a lot of patients who tell me, you know, they're 16 and they think they want to have their first child when they're 22 or 23. And so they don't want a 10 year method, even though a pair guard might be a really good option for them for other reasons. So making sure that people understand uh, fully are fully aware that they they are in control of the method and they can have it removed at any time, I think is really important. OK, next slide, please. Uh, we did some thinking again about the LARC counseling that many of us did and probably many of you did during the lockdown when we were talking to young people over the phone or over video. So some of these uh, concepts I think are especially important in that context, but they matter regardless of where you're doing it. Um, and if you all have other ideas about key components of LARC counseling, things that you find particularly useful to talk to young people about, we hope that you'll throw those into the chat so we can all learn. I think one of the absolutely most important things, I don't need to tell any of you this, is that people, young people really need privacy and confidentiality when they're talking to you about their contraceptive methods and ensuring that in the context of a telehealth visit, of a phone or video visit can be really challenging. So talking to young people about where they are, do they have privacy, if they're, you know, in their home with lots of people around them, is there a place that they, go, that they can go to be private? I've had more than one counseling session with a young person who was in their bathroom because that was the only place with the door that closed or outside in their car or walking around. So helping them kind of problem solve um, 
a lot of we also tried to get creative using secure texting if that's an option or texting through if you're using something like zoom texting or chatting through that can be can help to sort of bolster the conversation that you can have just as with any visit it's always really important to take some time to establish rapport to con connect with the young person find out what they're interested in i think those of us who have done a lot of contraceptive counseling come at this often with a lot of our own agendas about what we want to tell young people. And it's really important to use a patient centered approach to counseling where you're finding out what people are interested in hearing and what they want to learn about and talking to them about that. Um, and then, as we said, if you know, telephone or video visits can be really useful in a setting where people can't come into clinic for whatever set of reasons. Okay, next slide, please. Sorry, I'm definitely experiencing a little bit of lag. Um, okay, I'm going to talk just briefly about the sort of components of, of counseling for LARCs, and then again, my colleagues are going to talk more about the details. So really important to talk to people about the, what the insertion procedures are like, whether it's an explanon or an IUD. I, I always, and I suspect many of you do too, I ask people how how much information they want and what kind of information they want. Some people, I had a patient yesterday actually in person, but who really wanted to see every instrument instrument on my tray. And I have other patients, as I'm sure you do, who are absolutely not interested in seeing anything that might look scary. So finding out what they, how much information they want and what kind of information is important. Really, I want to, I want to linger for a minute over the concept of um, the changes in bleeding that um, that can occur with almost all of the LARCs. We as providers tend to talk about irregular bleeding and what I have learned the hard way over time is that most of our patients really, many of our patients really don't know what that means. And so I have shifted my language to talking about unpredictable bleeding because that's really what we're talking about. Um, and checking in with patients, has your bleeding ever been unpredictable? What was that like for you? How do you think you would manage it? Um, we talk to people about aftercare, particularly with IUDs, making sure they know that it's normal to have a few days of cramping and talking to them about how they might manage that in terms of heat or NSAIDs or the combination. Um, we counsel people about what we now call the kind of extended duration. Uh, the paraguards can last for up to 12 years, next one on for four to five, depending on whose studies you're reading, um, and Lilettas and Marinas up to seven. In, new for many of us is that not only the Paragard, but also the Mirena can be, now be used for emergency contraception, which is a huge um, advantage, I think, or a huge step forward. A lot of us have patients who are interested in Mirenas, but weren't previously able to use those for, for emergency contraception. Um, we talk about removal. What does it take to take out an explanon? What does it take to take out an IUD? And again, reinforce that, you know, it's their choice when they're, when they're done with the method, we'll remove it for them. And then we all, I think, try to use some kind of teach back because even what I just said is a lot of information and making sure that young people understand what we've what we said and that they have the components. So I, I'd be curious to hear how other people do this. I usually just say something like like what I just said, like I just gave you a whole lot of information. Um, can you help me make sure that I didn't forget to tell you something and and tell me what what are the key things that you're taking away from this conversation or something like that? Um, okay, next slide, please. So again, um, when in-person visits are limited, whether that's because of a COVID surge or because of the way that your clinic is set up, um, we try to make sure that we're doing as much counseling as we can before the visit so that we're not having um, young people show up ready for their LARCs with so many questions that they really need an extra visit. So we send either, sometimes this is two visits in person, sometimes it's one visit on the phone and another visit in person, but we try to make sure that we send them some information between visits so they have time to review it. We send them links to resources so that they can continue learning. And we have some, uh, some of those links for you at the end of this presentation. Um, we, we make sure that young people know who they, they can, who they can contact between their counseling visit, whether it's on the phone or in person, and their insertion if, they're, if there is a second visit, if they have questions or concerns. And then again, in the co setting of COVID, making sure that people know 
what the restrictions are. You know, many of us, I'm sure, I'm not alone in having had young people in the past who came in, you know, for an IUD insertion with their four best friends. And I always really encourage that because young people need support and lots of their friends had questions and um, that was really helpful. Most most clinics won't let people do that at this point. So knowing what the restrictions are for, for you and making sure that your, your patients know about it is important as well. Um, okay, next slide, please. So just one more tip about telehealth, if you are doing some of this in, on video um, or on the phone. So if you're on video, I think paying really close attention to the nonverbal communication that you're getting from your patient. You know, if they're suddenly looking really tense or turning away, it may be that their, their privacy has ended. It may be that they have worries they're not telling you about, but just the same way that in person, we pay attention to nonverbal cues from patients, trying to do that as best you can over, over video. And then there are some advantages of technology. I think I've I've talked, I have, uh, what's the word? I have revealed my bias that a lot of these things over video are not so great, but when there are a few advantages and one of them is you can do a lot of screen sharing to so, show resources. You can use annotation and drawing tools to show, draw, I draw pictures all the time of uteri and um, IUDs in place to give people a sense of the size and the shape. And that can be really helpful. I do that in person too, usually on the table paper, but it's actually, that works better on Zoom. And then to the degree that you can manage administ any administrative tasks before an in-person visit. So if there are insurance confirmation issues, that can be helpful to get taken care of ahead of time. If the person can deal with payment, if there is any, hopefully there isn't much for most of our patients in most of our settings. And then, um, we can have patients electronically sign consent forms so that that's all ready to go when they come in. Next slide, please. Okay, I think we have another poll and then I'm gonna turn it over to Ann. Thank you. Um, I think that most folks have had a, a chance to do this last poll question, but if you haven't, you can go into the polls right now and, and, and fill it out. Um, Marcel had given us some data at the very beginning of the talk about um, what your answers were. So the question here was, teens identify which of the following as their primary deterrent to choosing a LARC. And I think at the time, 87% of you had fear of a painful procedure. And that's exactly right. Um, I think all four are true, but that is the obviously the, the, the most common reason why um, a adolescent would choose not to get a LARC. Next slide. So there was a study done in 2019 that was super interesting, um, looking at pre-procedural anxiety in adolescents. Um, um, and the red, it's hard to see, very small, are, are adolescents or young adults who've had IUDs, and the blue are Nexplanons. And so in total, over 90% of patients who came in had some level of mild, moderate, or severe anxiety before their procedure. Now, most of us in practice are not surprised by this, um, but it certainly raises the question of how can we improve this experience to avoid causing distress for such a vulnerable population. Go ahead and next slide. Great, so here are just some ways to start, and these are provider tips, but again, these are health educator tips, whoever's really in the room. Um, Definitely some of this we've covered a little before, but I'm just going to touch on again. So very essential to meet the patient fully clothed before the procedure. Um, give them lots of opportunity to quest ask questions. Maybe they had a visit, you've done counseling, maybe they forgot. So really review the steps of the procedure and offer to, um, to, to, to show them the IUD in the package before the procedure if they'd like to see it. Um, I tend to stay away from showing the instruments. I think that um, I, most of our uh, patients tend to have a lot more pre-procedural anxiety if they see them. So I tell all of our MAs to cover the exam tray with a chuck, keep it, keep it covered until the patient is lying down on the exam table. When they are lying down, that's when the provider, the clinician can remove that chuck and start making sure that they set up the exam table. Just make sure that all of those, um, those are, are unopened, um, they're not sterile um, until we take off that chuck and then we can prepare the exam tray. And the last is that we train our clinic staffs to be LARC doula. So um, I'll let um, Emma touch on that at the end of the presentation, but that's something that certainly you can incorporate in your health centers as well. Next slide. So the language we use as providers, you may know, you may 
as we've learned it, um, it's deeply paternalistic. It's disempowering. Okay, it's important to anticipate the potential existence of trauma and change the words we use. So one of the most important ways um, that we can build autonomy in this population is to model consent. So in all of our procedures, um, I say to our patients, before we start, I want you to be aware that you are in control of the pace today. If you want me to slow down, repeat myself, explain anything more, please let me know. Or if at any point you want me to stop the procedure, I will. Uh, the other way that we use our words is that we can, um, many of the worms, words that we use can induce harm or trauma. So be very careful of words like um, use exam table instead of the word bed. Um, be mindful of triggering language. Let the patient move into the position without any touching from you. Okay, and then also remove the focus on image. You know, don't or take away any words that insinuates that uh, the body or the vagina is not clean. So really, we will be we will give you these slides at the end of the presentation if you want to practice. Very important to just just remember the words we're using and change and practice those words. The last thing I like to talk about is that um, it's important to um, set expectations about discomfort, but to use neutral words. So there is something called a nocebo effect. So we know that studies have shown that anticipatory guidance describing pain makes it more likely for the patient to feel pain. So using words like pressure or sensation, you might feel some sensation now, practice those deep breathing or um, let me know if you feel any discomfort so I can try to fix that. Things like that can very much set up um, the, the patient uh, for a, a better positive experience. Next slide. So I'd like to talk just a little bit about the pelvic exam. So since recommendations for PAPS have changed and we're doing, we're starting PAPS at age 21, many of our adolescents when we're doing these IUD procedures are having a pelvic exam for the very first time. It's super important again to review that speculum exam, show them the speculum while they're dressed, and again, discuss the signal to pause. So we're modeling consent always, we're building autonomy, we're allowing them to pause the procedure if they want to during this part of the, of the IUD. Um, I always recommend to use, uh, to use gel lubrication. Um, it does, it has been indicated to, sh to reduce pain. And be very important about choosing what size speculum you use. So there are two kinds that we recommend or that we use. The graves are those wider and shorter speculums, and they can often have a little bit less discomfort during a vaginal exam. There's also the Peterson. They're, they're a little bit longer and more narrow. I often bring two different sizes into every visit with me so I can choose or change without um, leaving the room and move slowly. And I cannot repeat this enough. The slower you go in a pelvic exam, the less uncomfortable it is for a patient. Next slide. Okay, so this was um, a graphic that Karen Mextroff, um has, has illustrated, which really nicely looks at which parts of the IUD insertion are uncomfortable for a patient. So this is something we do a lot of teaching with our health educators so they understand and can anticipate which parts are going to feel pain. We talked a little bit about that by me, or the speculum exam. The tenaculum, there's a little bit more pain there. And then the sounding and insertion, there's more pain. And the post-procedure, there is some, some cramping and pain as well. So important to, know, to understand as clinicians, but also for the whole, um, the whole counselors, the health educators, medical assistants as well, whoever is helping with those procedures. Okay, next slide. So just wanted to touch a little bit about the pharmacological management for IUD placements. Um, and NSAIDs generally, be the benefits outweigh the risks. We know that it decreases uterine cramping, it's safe, and it also validates the patient need for pain control. And naproxen is um, more effective than ibuprofen, and um, ha ibuprofen has less effect on platelet aggregation, especially if there's bleeding after procedure. The evidence does not support the routine use of misoprostol or topical benzocaine or intrauterine lidocaine. However, it does support paracervical lidocaine, topical lidocaine spray, and a tenaculum block. 
The last, um, the tenaculum block, you can go to the next slide, is something that we train at La Clinica. We do a, it's the most effective. It's the, in, we do an intracervical injection um, at 12 o'clock. Um, we do one cc of 1% lidocaine with a 25 gauge needle, one to two millimeters superficially and inject it slowly. And th again, this is really helpful for the tenaculum placement only. It does not help with the pain control during, for sounding or for, um, or for the IUD placement, but we feel very strongly that at any point during this procedure, if we can minimize discomfort or pain, it is helpful for our patients. Um, it's the, there's been studies that have also shown that forced cough, lidocaine spray, or a lidocaine gel is also effective here, and that's um, there's some sources down at the bottom if you're interested in learning more about that. But the last thing we wanted to talk a little bit about is the Lark Doula program. So I'm gonna pass it over to Emma right now. Great, thank you. Um, and I just want to put a little reminder, if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to add them to the chat as we keep going. Um, I'm really excited to be able to talk about the doula program because I think it's a, a intervention in a way to help um, adolescents feel comfortable and manage pain um, that I hadn't heard of before I came to La Clinica. Um, so a lot of us have heard of a doula in the context of um, uh, you know, giving birth, or actually there are abortion doulas, there are, are doulas who are meant to support uh, around a lot of uh, procedures. Um, and one thing that we have found to work really well is having a LARC doula, um, which is someone who is trained to provide emotional, physical, and informational support before, during, and after a LARC procedure. Um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, the LARC doulas uh, that we, we train um, our health educators, um, sometimes our MAs and our, our staff um, to support patients during the procedure, both insertions and removals of IUDs and implants. Um, and the, the focus of the work, um, kind of connecting back to what's been said about the history of reproductive coercion um, and uh, kind of acknowledging that past as well as pe patients' fear of pain is to um, increase patients' sense of control, participation, and understanding in the entire process. So a big part of the LARC doula's role is to understand um, what is going to happen to be able to anticipate when pain points are likely to occur for a patient, um, and then uh, to be able to offer support along the way. And I'm going to talk in a second about some of the tools that we, we give um, our staff to be able to do that. Um, but again, the biggest piece is, is really also um, something that I have found really helpful um, is just having another person in the room during that insertion process. Um, when there's a power dynamic that's often happening with a medical provider and a patient, having an additional health educator in the room who can sort of the, health, the patient might see as an advocate um, or a support emotionally in the moment um, is really helpful um, to add to that, that feeling of, of power in the moment. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, so as I mentioned, one big goal of um, the LARC doula is to share information. Um, so they are often our counselors. Um, so they sometimes in the model that we use may have done counseling to help a patient get to the point where they're ready for the insertion. Sometimes they have not, um, but they still will come in and kind of talk to the patient ahead of time about what they can anticipate in collaboration with the medical provider. Um, and I was actually talking to somebody about this program who asked about if, if it felt like um, having a LARC doula in the room was kind of a, a threat to a medical provider's relationship with the patient. And I was talking about how actually when it's done well, um, I think it improves everybody's relationships with each other because there's such a collaborative effort that goes into making sure that everyone knows um, what they can anticipate next. Um, and then additionally, um, the last but not least, the other goal really is around support of the young person in the process as we know that they're experiencing a lot of anxiety. Um, next slide, please. So um, zooming out for one second, um, we were talking a lot uh, as we were preparing for this, this presentation about um, shortages of staff right now that are impacting our clinics. And so we wanted to just mention that um, the way that we've managed this um, with, at La Clinica has been that we've actually trained volunteers. Um, we have AmeriCorps health educators who are trained to, as LARC doulas. 
Um, and during the pandemic, when we had large layoffs, we uh, trained our MAs. Um, and I would argue that you probably can train any other support staff as long as folks are really, um, you know, motivated to learn um, and, and want to be support um, in this process. Um, for our AmeriCorps health educators, we do um, a, a about two week long intensive training around all kinds of um, issues that will support them in their counseling role um, first. Um, so I want to acknowledge that that, that usually includes um, a lot of information about trauma-informed care, sexual and reproductive health in general and content, um, and a lot of the other pieces that um, uh, my colleagues were talking about earlier. Um, but in addition, we offer this three hour training, which includes the topics that are listed here. Um, over uh, the pandemic, like I mentioned, I did this training specifically for our MAs um, too, to help prepare them um, to do the, uh, the do learning process. And it's all about three hours long. Um, so we usually will do a general birth control counseling basics again, so that um, all of our doulas are aware of the options for the patient um, and also of how we might talk about it um, following a lot of the guidance that was offered earlier. Um, we will explore personal bias um, that staff bring um, and define shared clinic values. So I usually do um, an exercise where I have like a agree disagree statements written out and um, I don't really look at the answers that our staff provide, but I just have them for themselves, um, you know, talk about, check off for themselves in an on as honest as they can be um, about what they are bringing to the table when we're talking about um, sexual and reproductive health care. Um, and then we have a conversation about it where then I kind of point out some of the ways that our goal is never to get rid of our bias because we're never going to be able to do that, but instead to be able to recognize it and to be able to drop that when we're in front of the patient and um, support what we, we are agreeing to share as a clinic in terms of our values. Um, we also will review basics of trauma-informed care as it shows up around sexual and reproductive health counseling, um, in particular around sexual trauma and how to be aware that all any patient coming in may have experienced some type of sexual trauma and um, in particular around IUDs that can cause more anxiety um, for insertion and removal. So um, that's just a part of the, the counseling process that we train folks on. Um, we talk about uh, the history of coercion and racism, actually using a very similar model to what uh, you saw here today um, to make sure that our doulas understand um, their role as it relates to these, these kind of larger systems of power. Um, and then we talk about also uh, what Erin just showed of when uh, throughout the procedure, patients might be expected to experience more or less pain. Um, so that uh, a health educator, when um, you know a provider is pulling a particular instrument out, might anticipate, okay, this is going to be a little bit harder for the patient. They won't necessarily say that to the patient unless it's appropriate, but they might prepare um, one of the tools that might help with pain in that moment. Um, and then uh, we teach them tangible doula skills, which I'm going to talk about in one second. And then I will also usually talk about strategies for answering difficult questions, because sometimes questions come up that throw our um, health educators off or might, they've never heard before or might be one um, that they're not ready to answer. And so we talk about strategies for those moments. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to mention one of the things we started this year is that I created a, a sign off list. Um, so after this three um, hour training is done, um, our health educators take this list, which includes all the skills that we want them to be proficient in, to be able to be a LARC doula. They take it to clinic with them, um, and then they work with a provider. The provider will use this checklist to do a kind of, um, once they, they jump in the clinic and support as a doula, they'll do a little debrief together. And if the provider feels that they've checked all of that list off, um, they'll sign them off to proceed as a LARC doula on their own with, that, with less observation in the future. And if not, they'll give some feedback and then the health educator will sort of repeat until um, the, the provider feels comfortable signing them off. Next slide, please. Um, a lot of this was already covered, so I'm going to kind of go quickly through this so we have time for questions. Um, 
But uh, these are some of the shared values when I mentioned earlier um, that we'll talk about shared clinic values that we will talk about. So um, we value knowing our own biases. Um, we talk about being sex positive, but trauma informed. So, um, you know, we believe young people can make their own choices about sex and we trust them to do so. And we also understand this is a complex decision that can certainly be impacted by trauma and is impacted by trauma for many of our young people. Um, so our goal is really to support them in being proud of making their deci sexual decisions um, and having a safe and um, way to stay healthy as they do so. So basically sex can be positive when it feels like it's the right choice and when they're in a safe space. Um, we talk about a uh, strengths-based approach. So we're starting with a place of getting to know the patient more, um, searching for uh, the strengths young people bring in making their own decision and then making sure that our role is to sort of help them sort through all those options. Um, we want to come from a gender um, affirming uh, approach. So one of the simple ways that we talk about doing that, um, as has been modeled here, is moving away from using um, gendered terms like boy or girl and instead to specifically talk about the anatomy that we're referring to. So a person with a penis or a person with a vagina or uterus. Um, as I mentioned before, we talk about assuming that anyone that we are talking to may have experienced some kind of um, sexual trauma. Um, and so some tangible ways that we talk about addressing this is avoiding using um, the, the language of you when we're describing what's going to happen and instead saying like someone who. So um, someone who's getting a, an IUD inserted um, might expect this to happen when at this point in the procedure instead of you. Um, so we're not putting them in a situation where they're forced to picture themselves. Um, going through a process when they're not ready to do so. Um, so that's just one example. Um, and then uh, lastly, we're talking to um, the health educators about referring to others one step. We know that there's going to be times when they don't know things. We don't expect them to be experts. Um, and they're really there for support. And that's why they're doing collaborative work with the provider. Next slide. So yeah, we're gonna move into just some really um, basic tools that we give our health educators to bring in them in the room with them when they're they're um, acting as uh, doulas. And so when we the health educator or the doula walks in the room to introduce themselves, um, they'll usually start by reviewing some of the tools they have. They'll introduce themselves, they'll explain the role of the doula to make sure the patient is ready and wants the doula, and then they will uh, start reviewing some tools that they might use later saying okay we're gonna can we practice some some breathing together um this might be a tool that we can use together when things if things start to feel uncomfortable or um down the road in the in the process um so diaphragmatic breathing um basically is focused breathing um and so uh literally word for word this is something health educators will say so focused breathing can bring comfort and relieve tension um, so they'll have the patient place their hand on their belly um, and walk them through when you inhale deeply your belly rises when you exhale deeply your belly lowers ready let's try it together so again practicing and then they'll bring that in um, and have the patient practice that together after um, when they need it um next slide please um, the next tool that we offer is um, at the beginning, uh, the health educator can can offer for uh, the patient to sort of squeeze their two fingers um, if they start to feel some discomfort. Um, I think that that offer can be really warm um, and welcoming. Um, and and uh, also, if we have them squeeze the two fingers, they're less likely the health educators themselves to feel pain. Um, it shows patients to, as, as a part of this, that we're interested in them and want to be um, kind of comforting them. Um, and usually when we offer this as well, we might start getting to know the patient too, asking them about their hobbies, their studies, what their dreams are, those kinds of things to start creating a safe space. Sometimes patients will already know at that point what they need um, and they might prefer, for example, to be distracted as opposed to um, to to be doing these other tools, but it's good to have options. Next slide, please. Um, music is um, one of the things that we have found to be 
uh, almost most important in terms of adding relaxation to the space. So it used to be that we actually would say, you know, do you want music? Um, now we're moving more towards, um, I'm going to put some some spa music on in the background. Is that okay with you? Because what we found is that putting that that music on can actually relax everyone in the room. So the provider who might have some some anxiety about insertion, especially if they're st still learning, the health educator or the LARC doula, as well as the patient. Um, and sometimes patients do want to just keep listening to their own music, which is fine. They might have their own headphones in, but still playing that music is helpful to everyone in the room. Next slide, please. Um, we have um, created LARC doula kits for all of our clinics that include um, some eye pillows that have a lavender scent to them. Obviously, if a, we have non-scented um, pillows as an option as well in case patients um, uh, are allergic or have issues with the, with the smell. But um, this can be really helpful to offer. It also can um, block out harsh clinic lights that can cause some more sort of anxiety for a patient as well to have eye pillows available. So we found that to be really useful. Next slide, please. Um, and then we we also bring in um, a heat pack with us, um, and uh, it's just an in, instant hot compress. Um, and and the Lark Duo will, will place it or offer to place it on the patient's lower belly um, when cramping begins during and after the procedure. So. Um, a lot of times we'll have the, the doula actually wait until the pain begins and to bring that in um, then, but usually at the beginning, they'll introduce that as an option for a tool as well. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, this is another um, tool that I found really useful in the clinic with patients when we've been talking about this. Um, I think some of them have actually, in some of our sites, heard of this in the past, like trying to picture a place that you can um, can be and feel comfortable. And so this is language that the health educators can bring with them into the room. Imagine being in your favorite place. Maybe it's a beach or the woods or your room, somewhere where you feel relaxed, comfortable, and in control. Notice everything about it, the way it looks, sounds, smells, and feels. I invite you to stay in this place where you're relaxed. Um, if you start to leave this place, I invite you to come right back to it. Um, et cetera, so I won't read the whole thing, but essentially um, it's kind of helping a person to, to reground themselves. Um, and it can be another tool um, that somebody can opt into as well. Next slide, please. The last thing we added recently is um, a, a fan to our, our Lark Doula kit um, because we found that a lot of patients when they're um, feeling pain will get overwhelmed and um, the, the fan can help with temperature regulation. Um, sometimes there are a lot of people in our rooms um, or the procedure can take longer than expected. Um, so, you know, if a patient is starting to, to sweat, um, they, can, they can use the fan to help them calm down. And it also, again, gives them a sense of control over their surroundings as much as we can. Um, and I think that's, that's the last thing I'll sort of say about all of these tools is um, having a variety of options allows our health educators to introduce themselves um, and then to, to help, help the patient to make some decisions, offer the variety of options that we have, and then give the power to the patient to decide, you know, which of these tools feels the most helpful to you. And with that, um, we'll open it up for questions. So um, Emma and Aaron, there's, Aaron, there's quest one question already, which is, are LARC doulas easily accessible and can they be requested? Or how would you go about having a LARC doula during a procedure or insertion? Aaron, do you want to take this or do you want me to? Go ahead, Emma, and I'll add anything if yeah, so so usually the, the good thing about having um, our support staff be trained as LARC doulas is that they're already in the clinic when a patient is coming in. And so um, usually in, the, in, in our clinics, we do um, something called huddle in the morning where we're working all together as a um, staff and looking over the patients who are planned to come in. So at that moment, our providers, if they have a um, LARC insertion or removal on, on the schedule might say, check in to see if somebody can step in as um, as the LARC doula. 
Um, and so if there's a health educator on site who's already been trained, they'll do that. Um, and that's sort of the default. Um, and if there if there's not, then that might be when the MA or another support staff um, would decide to come in and, and support. I, I just also will say, I think this is happening already a little bit without the training. Like I know that some of our MAs were already supporting in the in the clinics just because kids would ask, like, can you come hold my hand? Um, so this is just gives some more tools and really allows for for it to happen systematically. I don't know, Erin, if you have anything else. No, I, I think that's a great summary. And the other thing I would add for Bay Area folks, at least, is that um, we are doing this training um, internally at uh, many of our adolescent health centers beyond school based health centers. Um, at La Clinica, but um, I see a lot of folks with from lifelong Native American um, and Berkeley, um, and we're happy to come out and do some specific training um, locally uh, to to sort of get some of your health educators or MAs up to speed on on becoming a LARF doula. And I would I know. I'm sorry. I would just say that, you know, we're talking about this primarily for IUD insertion because it is the scarier procedure and it is a longer procedure, but I've also used this um, for next plan insertions and uh, I had a, a NP student with me who had gone to, you know, one of the trainings and so she, you know, she, she and I took turns being the doulas, you know, she was a doula for an insertion and then when she was ready to do an insertion, you know, she, um, you know, I did that for her and it just changes the atmosphere in the room. It just makes it so much more fun. We had a question. Um, how would we request a doula if we're attending a clinic with no doulas in attendance? I think, I mean, I think maybe Emma partly answered that already that in many clinics, medical assistants and other staff have already been, that's certainly true in my clinic too, have been functioning in a sense as doulas, um, but not with anything like the kind of training that Emma and Aaron have undertaken. I don't know if anybody else of my, any of my colleagues want to add more to that. I mean, it's one of the reasons I think we're doing the workshop so that more people can train each other um, and that, that this is really more of a built-in part of the clinic. Um, so I don't know, I don't know if there's like an official, you know, if you are having a baby, there's ways to, you know, pay for a doula and have the doula come with you. And I don't, I don't think that there isn't anything like that set up. Um, but that might be, you know, something good for, you know, folks in the room to think about asking, you know, asking their clinics, you know, asking, well, you know, what are the procedures to support patients? Or for people who are thinking about something for themselves, like what are the procedures to support me through this procedure? You know, what what's going on? Um, Absolutely, Naomi. I, I think that um, integrating it into our our, our clinics, um, either through you know acknowledging who which patients might be um, need a doula at the beginning of the clinic, who's having a procedure um, during a huddle at the beginning, this is is a super helpful idea from Emma. Um, you know, I think that study from 2019, which talked a little bit about pre-procedural anxiety is super interesting because the rates of anxiety are the same, whether they're getting an IUD or an explanon. And for us as providers, you know, when I have an explanon insertion, you know, it's, it's, le it's much less uh, consuming for me than an IUD. And I will sometimes minimize that and not acknowledge that the anxiety levels are exactly the same. Um, essentially for the patient. So really important to integrate having a support person for every single procedure. And it could be also removal as well. So there's a question um, asking for any tips on engaging or recruiting volunteers separate from AmeriCorps. So for folks who maybe don't have AmeriCorps in their clinic. You know, we didn't have AmeriCorps for all of COVID and we got by by training our medical assistants. Um, and this was a super empowering experience for them because this is not um, 
something they normally would um, would 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 add to their skill set, um, but it 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 helped them engage with our patients in a much more meaningful way. I had many MAs um, who really walked away from their experiences feeling like this was really the best part of their day as well. Um, that said, they have a lot on their plate, um, and it's hard to um, bring your MA in. Um, but I have, I have talked to, I've trained a lot of providers, male providers who also need a chaperone in the clinic or in the in the room with them, and and that's helpful to you know use your MA um, who's who's going to be the chaperone also as your doula. Um, so definitely train as many people as you can. In other words. I also think if you are considering like trying to start opening positions for volunteers to do this, that could be a really cool role. I think for our AmeriCorps is one of the, the reasons they want to do the program is because many of them are young right out of school and like looking to move into the medical field um, are considering maybe going back to, to medical school or um, we really want to make it a, a pathway for people from the community um, BIPOC folks who might not otherwise have access to the medical field. So I think um, thinking of it as kind of a training program, even if it is just to be a LARC doula and promoting it that way um, as you're recruiting for, for a position like this, if that's what you meant, I'm not sure if that's what the question meant, but um, has been really helpful for us as well as promoting it in our schools um, in case there are like teachers or staff who have um, graduated students who they think might be good fits for um, supporting people from the community. The other thing that I've done informally, which again was easier pre-COVID, but a lot of young people come to visits with, with somebody, right? They come with their partner, they come with their best friend or two or three, like I said before. Um, it's certainly not the same as a trained doula, but if someone does come with a support person and they want that person in the room with them during the procedure, I'll do like a one minute training for the support person. Like, okay, here's some things you can do to help your friend be comfortable or your partner or whatever. Um, and I think it also, it reduces the chances that the support person is gonna get queasy and, um, and faint, which has happened to me. <laughs> um, and also gives them, you know, gives the patient some support and gives the support person a job. And that, uh, that can be also really sweet and effective. Great. And, and lastly, as the provider, I've often acted as the Lark doula as well. And I'm sure totally. many of us <laughs> as well. Yeah. But you know, I if I don't have access to anyone um, in the clinic that day, I will bring in my phone and I will put in put on that that music and I will give them the eye pillow and I will give them the heat pack and I will do all of the things. I'm not there to hold their hand, but it's you know, I think that we can all act in this this capacity to some extent. Absolutely. I also see a question in asking whether we have training info that we can share in particular it looks like for malia at the city of berkeley because you have americorps members and i would say um, my contact information is on here so in particular for americorps please reach out to me by email and i'm happy to share a bunch of the resources that that i've created we can talk to Aaron too about that any other questions that folks have the, the last can actually can you go to the last slide so the last slide has resources on it they're pretty I, i'm finding it hard to read them in this format but when you get a chance to look at the slides later hopefully they'll be more visible so lots of resources both for for clinicians and for patients that hopefully will be useful for, to folks trying to do more of this in your own clinics i see one more question are issues like endometriosis pcos and I actually don't know what this one is. Adenomyosis. Thank you. Which mm -hmm. can cause unscheduled bleeding commonly discussed during contraceptive counseling. Um, is, if the question is, if a patient has a diagnosis of one of those things, do we talk about it in the context of their contraceptive choices? Absolutely. If that's not what you mean, what the asker means, could you clarify? But I mean, yes, contraception is uh, both um, combined oral contraceptives or combined contraceptives, the pill and the patch and the ring, and various LARCs are sometimes used as one of the parts of the management strategy for conditions like endometriosis and PCOS, depending on the patient's 
specific diagnosis and their contraceptive desires or pregnancy desires. I hope that I hope that answers the question. Any other questions? It looks like we have one minute before we turn into pumpkins. Thanks everybody for coming and for your questions. Thank you all.